All right, good morning, everyone. We, we're good? All set, all right. Welcome, everyone, online. Welcome, good morning, everybody. Please take out your Bibles and open them up to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. And while you're doing that, just a reminder, um, just a couple of weeks away from, from Christmas. I won't tell you how many shopping days are left because I really don't care. I don't know how many, but we're getting close, right? Um, the, uh, just a reminder, that evening, Christmas Eve, that Saturday, we are having a candlelight service. We'll have a potluck beforehand starting at about 5 o'clock, and the, the candlelight service will probably get kicked off around 6.30 or so. Um, just always a special time to gather together as a group to, to praise the Lord for, again, the incarnation, as we'll touch on just a little bit this morning, but that we'll look at it in great detail that evening. But uh, please plan on being a part of that. It is at Living Waters uh, the Fellowship. Uh, information will be getting uh, directions and all of that to you. But please sign up also, um, either online or at the table outside for the potluck afterwards. But we do have the link on the too, so you can just click on that on the website. So, all right, so we are in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. So if you'd follow along with me, beginning in verse 1. And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his garments became radiant and exceedingly white as no launderer on earth could whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, and they became terrified. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. All at once they looked around and saw no one with them anymore except Jesus alone. Here we see what is common, commonly referred to as the transfiguration. It's recorded also in Matthew chapter 17 and Luke chapter 9. And I do believe as this week, as I was studying and preparing for this, this is so such a, a, an amazing piece that fits on the end of what we have looked at the last couple of weeks. We have to look at this in context. And we talked about last week, Jesus talking about the discipleship requirements, what it means to follow after him. Remember, he said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We talked in detail about what that means. And it's amazing when you think about it, not one of the disciples said, you know what, I'm out, I'm done. <laughs> you know, If that's what it takes, I don't want any part of it. No, they all stayed. As a matter of fact, they all were willing to go all the way as we, we look through church history, all the way to their own deaths following after Jesus. And we saw last week, as we finish up chapter 8, if you'll look at verse 38, it speaks of his coming again in glory. It says, Jesus speaking again after talking to them about what discipleship means, he says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him, notice, when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. He's talking about, again, his second coming now. He has just been talking with them about the fact that this first time that he comes is going to end in his suffering, in his death, and in his resurrection. But after resurrection comes glory. And th this whole thing that they're talking about. Now, isn't it interesting, though? We talked about this again a couple of weeks ago, that Peter, what did Peter hear? You're going to suffer and die? <laughs> Not on my watch kind of thing, right? And this whole thing. Total selective hearing. Wives, did any of your husbands have selective hearing? Right? Understand what that? We hear what we want to hear. We don't, or, or we hear the first part and block out the rest. I'm no, I know I'm guilty of that. Somebody's talking to me. I hear one thing. I focus in on that. They keep, might be talking for another few minutes. I miss all the rest because I'm focused in on that one thing. The same thing happened with the disciples. And Peter, again, representative of the disciples, heard only that, reacted to the first part, totally again missing. Again, resurrection, glorification, his second coming, as he's going to talk about. He's coming again. Now, chapter 9 
begins with verse 1. Jesus was saying to them as he's continuing this conversation, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing right here, right now, who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now that verse obviously can seem a little confusing. It's caused, been controversial over time. But if we look at it in context, if we look at it in the context of what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, it really kind of makes a whole lot of sense. It becomes really clear. All three gospel accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have all of these events all together. Not one account has the transfiguration later on or whatever. It all flows in the same order as we have been looking at it in the Gospel of Mark here. And the transfiguration, as we see now, really is just a preview and a guarantee of Jesus' resurrection and second coming. It's like a preview of coming attractions. It's a guarantee of what is going to take place, not just his death and his, his suffering and his death, but also his resurrection and his second coming in glory. If you'll remember back in chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus said, as he's at the, the outset of his ministry, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's recorded very early on in the gospel that Jesus is saying that. Now, how could he say that the kingdom of God is ha at hand? Well, because the king is here. <laughs> Jesus being the king of kings and lord of lords, he is now here. And some in the group here, now, in where we are in chapter 9, some in this group will get a glimpse of the king in all of his glory. And as he will be forever. Now it tells us that he takes them, he takes Peter, James, and John, these three, he takes them up on a high mountain. Now we don't know which mountain, if it was important, he would have told us here in the scriptures, it would be recorded for us if it was important which mountain. It's interesting that even though there is no mountain here, there's a whole lot of effort to try to find out which mountain <laughs> and which one it is. And there's even, um, I think it's on Mount Tabor, there's actually a shrine called the, the Mount of Transfiguration or the Shrine of Transfiguration or something like that, which quite honestly has very little chance of actually being the mountain. It's nowhere close to Caesarea Philippi. It's all the way down in the south, but somebody thought it was a good idea to put a shrine there and everything. A lot of people believe it's Mount Hermon and a lot of good arguments for that, but it's not important. <laughs> and some of those things, it's interesting because I believe part of the reason why God doesn't tell us these things in here is because we have a tendency to worship those types of things. I mean, if, if we actually knew that it was the place where Jesus was transfigured, how many of you would make sure you went there or whatever it was and it was that place and it was that all of a sudden that became the focal point as opposed to what took place there? We have such a tendency to idolize those types of things. So it's not recorded for us here. He takes with him Peter, James, and John, and they experience the unexplainable, the unimaginable takes place in this picture, in this scene. And it's, it just strikes me that on the heels of everything that Jesus and we were looking at last week, that if we are willing to follow after Jesus, if we are willing to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and to follow after him, we're going to see unexplainable things. We are going to experience unimaginable things if we will simply be obedient. In Luke's account in this, in Luke chapter 9, verse 28, it tells us that he took them with them to go up to the mountain and to pray. And they're going up there, and you can only imagine, again, the conversation that's taking place, talking about discipleship, talking about following after him, maybe even asking specific questions. What, what, what specifically does that mean? It's not recorded for us, but you can only imagine the conversation that is taking place. And he takes, again, Peter, James, and John, the, the inner circle, if you would. These three, Peter, James, and John, were taken by Jesus to experience some things that others in the, in the, in the group of the twelve didn't. I mean, he was, they were present when Jairus, when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. They were present in that. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus goes to pray, he takes Peter, James, and John further in to pray with him, to be closer with him during that time. And there's a lot of speculation. You, could, we, you, know, you can almost be kind of humorous about it. You know, I heard one say that these were the special ones when, when it could be that, no, no, these were the special ones that really needed extra, Jesus couldn't let them too far away kind of thing and all of that kind of stuff. Again, it doesn't really tell us, but Christina and I were talking about it the other morning. It's really interesting when you just kind of think about it. Peter, 
Peter is going to be the one that will deny him. Peter is going to be the one that will stand up and proudly say, I won't, no matter what these guys do, I will never deny you. Yet, Jesus said tonight before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And that played out. And then he, was going, he would be the one then that would be restored and all of this kind of stuff. To get this special glimpse of Jesus when he, after his failure, to be able to look back on it and say, this is the one. This is the one. I, I saw him in his glory. James is going to be the first martyr. He's going to be the first one of the disciples to give his life for following Jesus. And it happens within very short time of when Jesus ascends to heaven, what, like almost within weeks of when it takes, G- James is going to be executed for following Jesus. And you can kind of look at that and ask the question, like after all of that, after all of the training, after all of the stuff, and, he, and he's going to die that quickly? And kind of wonder why. And when we think about those things, okay, you ever wonder why? <laughs> you ever questioned, Lord, I don't understand why this is all going on. It seems like there should have been a different end to all of this as, as we go through things in our life. But then to be able to look back and to be able to say, but he's the king. <laughs> Experience that closeness with him in this situation. And John John's going to be the one that outlives them all. James is his brother. He dies right away. John outlives them all. He's going to live to, to be in his 90s, more than likely. that don't know exactly how old he was at the time. But he's going to be the one that's alone on the island of Patmos. Years after all of the rest of the disciples have, have died, he's still alive. <laughs> kind of in that, and all alone on the island of Patmos. But to be able to look back at this moment. The closeness of Jesus, the seeing things as he reveals more and more of himself to them and again to us when we fail, when we question, well, Lord, I don't understand why. When we feel all alone, we can go back to those times when he revealed himself to us so personally and intimately in his word and, and in prayer and hold on to those things. Well, Luke again tells us that that gives us some more detail around what took place here. It tells us that once they got up on top of the mountain, the disciples fell asleep. They were sleeping while Jesus was praying, and we see that later on, too. That became kind of a, a regular thing. That happens again in the garden. They fall asleep when Jesus is praying. Isn't that a great to know? That when we're tired, we're worn out, we're sleeping, he's still interceding for us. Hebrews tells us that he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Anybody ever fall asleep praying? All the time. I mean, it's like, Lord, and you start going through and you're praying, and then all of a sudden you wake up, it's the next morning, and you're like, oh, man, he didn't fall asleep. He didn't, it's not like, oh, man, I forgot to ask this. He knows. And he always lives to make intercession for us. And that's such a comfort to me, and I, I hope to you as well. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. He understands. Well, they wake up. And it tells us that they see Jesus transfigured before them. That word, Greek word, many probably know is metamorpho, where we get our English term metamorphosis, that process of the caterpillar becoming a butterfly. His appearance changed. He did not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can't change. But his appearance changed before them. What was his nature on the inside became visible on the outside, if you would. And it's not, it's, it's, a, it's, a nice, it's a good way to look at that whole idea of metamorphosis, the visibility becoming something different, but the not changing, if that makes any sense. It's not, it's not like, like when a butterfly becomes a butterfly, it's not like the caterpillar crawls out of the, the cocoon and then the, the wings fall on top of them and, you know, kind of like, you know, Iron Man outfit coming on top of them and everything like that. No, this is his true nature now coming out. Briefly, because again, we're going to see when they come back down the mountain, it's not like anybody else could see it or understand it. And to a limited degree, not fully, that they could, could, could even embrace at that time. Hebrews 1.3, and we looked at this a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about who does the Bible say that Jesus is. Hebrews 1.3 tells us that he is the radiance, he, Jesus, is the radiance of his, God's glory, and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the power of his word. It says he is. He is, not he demonstrates. 
It's not like he's acting out something so that we can see it. He is the radiance. And again, notice the radiance, not the reflection. When we, Jesus says that he is the light, he also calls us the light. Well, he is the light giver. We are the light receiver and reflector. But that is not what this is talking about. He's not a reflection. He is the radiance of his glory. Jesus is the radiance of his glory because he is the glory. The sun is the cause. The sunburn is the effect, right? And so that it's, that's what happens with us, if you will. But he is the cause. And the exact representation, again, not reproduction, not something different, the exact representation of his nature. Again, Jesus himself said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. We are one. Now, the, the, the interesting thing, we look at this transfiguration and we see like this is, the, this is an incredible miracle that is taking place. No, it, the transfiguration isn't the miracle. It's the suspension of the ongoing miracle <laughs> that he has in all of his glory. He found, he created a, a human body that can hold that. <laughs> That's the miracle. We, that, that's the incarnation. That's what we celebrate during Christmas, that, that the glory of God, the full glory of God, he chose to put into a human body and dwell among us. Again, Philippians 2, we've looked at this a few times over the last couple of, of weeks. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. It wasn't something that he needed to hold on to. He is God. I don't feel like I need to hold on to Brett. I am Brett. <laughs> so that he, does, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That he would, he would encase his glory in a human body and dwell among us. John says in his gospel, John, one that was here, in John 1.14, he says, we saw his glory. And again, in a, in a, in a limited way, because in our, with our bodies now, we're going to talk about the fact that we're not going to have these forever, but in our, we, we can't handle all of his glory right now. We couldn't. But we saw his glory. We saw a glimpse of it. Peter writes in 2 Peter 1.16, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw it with our own eyes. It tells us too, when they wake up, they see Jesus in this way, gives us a description of how he is radiating. But he also, it also says that Elijah appeared with them, verse 4, and also with Moses. So Elijah and Moses are there. And I find that interesting that they recognized them. They, they saw them and they knew, somehow they knew, that's Moses. And that's Elijah. They, they didn't have, you know, pictures. <laughs> they didn't have any way, that they, any point of reference other than they knew that that's Moses and that's Elijah. There was no introduction. Jesus didn't introduce. Does it, and they weren't wearing name tags. They just knew that. And you wonder, have, have you ever, have you ever looked up to someone or, or heard someone on the radio or whatever, and you get a mental picture of what they look like, and then you actually see them, and you're like, no way, that's not them. There's no way that could be them because you have this mental picture. I wonder if that's kind of the case. They see, they see Moses, right? They're like Moses. Man, I thought he'd be taller. I, I, you know, I, I, whatever. And they, they look, but they recognize them. And that's, that's an awesome thing to me because this tells us that, guys, we are going to live on forever in a recognizable state. We're, we're going to live on with, with us, with who we are, with, with our personality. Now, it's going to be perfected. <laughs> Probably thinking, great. <laughs> These people won't be so annoying, right? <laughs> now, the bigger thing is you won't be so judgmental, <laughs> right? That's, that's the great part that I can't wait to get that lifted off of me. We'll be able to see everyone as God sees us. But our personalities will still be there. 
I love that. Moses and Elijah. Moses, obviously we know the one that through whom God brought the law, represents the law. 1,400 years prior to this moment was all of that was taking place. The exodus and all of that that's recorded for us. And the crazy thing about it is that after everything that Moses went through, leading the people, right, out of Egypt and through all of the years in the wilderness and all of that, he wasn't allowed to go into the promised land. And the, the Bible tells us in, in, in Exodus as to why, I mean, he, God told him to do something. He acted in a way that didn't represent God as he should. And because he was the leader, God said, you're not going to be allowed to enter into the promised land. And I don't know about you, but reading through that every time as I read through that, studied through that, talked through that, it's kind of like, seriously, man, that seems like a pretty harsh, harsh penalty for, for that. But again, understanding he is the representative and there's a higher expectation in, in that for that. But here we see, and this is awesome because guess where he is right now? He's in the promised land right here with the promised one. And he's, he's talking with him. How, how awesome. I guarantee you Moses took this trade. He said, if it was given to him as an option, he said, I'll take, I'll take that one for sure. You can, you can have going in there now. I'll t I, I'd, I'd much rather do that. I don't think it was given to him as an option, but I'm just saying. Now, Elijah also looked at as considered by many as the greatest of the prophets. 900 years prior to this event is when he, when he lived and he was taken to heaven in the chariot of fire. And here they are, the one representing the law and the prophets with the one who fulfilled it all. And they're talking with Jesus. And Luke 9, 31, again, fills in some blanks that Mark leaves out in his account. Mark tells us what they were speaking about. It says they were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Interesting, that word departure is the word exodus. Setting the captives free as Moses again, that picture that is there in Exodus fulfilling this Old Testament type of bringing the people out of, out of slavery, out of bondage, into the promised land. And here we see the fulfillment now, Jesus, the fulfillment of that Old Testament type. 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, Peter writes, as to this salvation, the salvation that you and I have received as a free gift. He says, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to, seeking to know what person or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So here we see Moses, Elijah, in their time when they were living, didn't understand it all what was coming. They knew and they understood that there would be this one that would come, that would suffer, that would die, that, you know, all of that. But they, it says made careful searches, trying to figure that out. But it was withheld from them then. But now we see, and can you only imagine, Moses and Elijah being here now with, with Jesus on top of the mountain, talking with him about his departure. I don't believe they were filling Jesus in. Jesus was filling them in. He was explaining to them. And again, what an amazing thing taking place here. And... Peter, James, and John witnessing it all. They woke up from their, their sleep, and this is going on, and they're seeing this. Can you imagine? It would just leave you speechless, you'd think. Verse 5. <laughs> Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Notice verse 6. For he did not know what to answer. For they became terrified. And now you can, many believe that Mark was, got, got his information, because he was not an eyewitness to, to, to all of this in the gospel. We've talked to this before. Most people believe, a lot of scholars believe, that Mark's source for his gospel information came from Peter. So can you imagine the conversation? Peter's telling him what took place. And Mark has to stop and go, you said what? <laughs> Seriously, you, you said that, really? Good. Verse 6, he didn't know what to say. Good thing, always, you know this, you've heard it before. If you, don't, if, if you don't know what to say, don't say anything. I heard it again this week. I hadn't heard it in a while. I love, I love this, and I 
need to make this more of a, a thing with me. If you can't improve on silence, don't try. So often, so often silence is that moment where you think, I gotta say something, I gotta say something. I, I'm guilty of that. If it's silent for more than 20 seconds, I feel like I gotta fill the space with noise. I, I just, because here, again, you can only, you can only imagine this conversation going on, and here Peter interrupts. Man, it's good for us to be here. <laughs> hey, let's, I got a great idea. Let's build these th three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And again, here's my mind working in this as I have my little picture, Moses and Elijah looking at Jesus kind of going, where'd you get this guy? But <laughs> I can only imagine because I've had this conversation with the Lord many times. And he looks at me and he says, remember when you did this and you said that? Yeah. <laughs> We're so quick, right? We're so easy to, to jump and, and point fingers or to be judgmental about something. And yet so often if we just take a moment and think, man, where God took me from. And even since then, how many times I've stuck my foot in my mouth or how many times I've done something that, you know, I look back on and say, man, why did, why did I feel I needed to do that? It's only by the grace of God that we can do anything that, that brings any type of glory to him. It's only by his grace that we aren't just a, a total mess everywhere. I'm drawn oftentimes to the humility of Paul as he writes through his letters where he refers to himself as the least of the saints, as the chiefest of sinners, never, never looking down on, on the mistakes of, of others, but just remembering where the Lord rescued him from. Well, Luke 9, 33 says, Peter didn't even realize what he was saying when he said it. He, again, just felt like he needed to be saying something. But what he was doing, what he, was, he was putting Moses and Elijah on the same level as Jesus. He was, he was saying, man, th these guys are great. And man, Jesus, you're awesome. Look, you're, you're right there with Moses and Elijah. Well, <laughs> he had just said moments, hours before, maybe a day or two before, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And here now in this situation, he's putting him down now with Moses and Elijah. And it tells us, Again, and now in Matthew's account, it says, while he's still speaking, the Father interrupts him. <laughs> you ever pray for that? Lord, if, if I start saying something stupid, interrupt me. <laughs> I, I need to pray for that more often. It tells us that the glory of God, the Shekinah glory of God now overshadows them, this, this cloud that comes and the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. Again, this is Moses and Elijah now are disappear from the picture. This is my beloved son. And that the, the way that it's written there in the, in, the, in, the, in the original language is be listening to him. It's not just listen, be listening, continually listen to him. What does he have to say? Because again, we, it's, it's so easy to do, right? Put yourself again in their, in their sandals. This is Moses and Elijah for crying out loud. My whole life we've been listening to them. We've been reading them. We've been studying them. We've been all of this stuff. There they are. But they all pointed to Jesus. It's all him. And we can have the tendency to do those same things. We can elevate, um, elevate people, elevate those different things. But again, it's Jesus. And be listening to him. Matthew Matthew's account, beginning in verse 6 of Matthew 17, it says, when the disciples heard this, when they heard the, the, the Father speak in this, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. It says, when the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, get up and do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus alone. 
again, just did put yourself in the story here. It, they're, they, they're seeing this. They now, that's awesome enough as it is. But then all of a sudden, the Shekinah glory of God comes down in a cloud and fa- the Father speaks from heaven. This is my beloved son. Be listening to him. They just fall flat down on their face. Totally <laughs> terrified. Paul, when he came face to face with with Jesus in Acts 22, he's recounting it, had, had a similar reaction. And it says, to, he says, what do you want from me? That's after the, you know, where he says, why are you persecuting me? You know, Jesus said that to him and he goes, what is it that you want from me? Isaiah 6, when he sees, sees the glory of God, you know, here am I, send me. Would you turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 1? Revelation chapter 1, now, this, the, the revelation of Jesus Christ has been recorded for us by John, again, one of the eyewitnesses to the transfigure that, transfiguration that we're looking at here. In Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, John is exiled on, on Patmos, alone there. And he hears a voice, and it says, When I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, verse 12, verse 13. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet and girded across the chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it had been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in all of its strength. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Fell on his face like a dead man. We see this response when they see Jesus. And as the church today, the church as a whole, needs a renewed reverence for the Lord Jesus. I don't know how you picture Jesus in your minds, but the only physical description we have of Jesus in the entire New Testament is what I just read. The entire New Testament. Now, we talked about this yesterday at the men's Bible study. We talked about this. Um, It was brought up, this, this section, and I made that comment. Again, this is the only physical description we have of the Lord Jesus. But if you try to make a mental image of this, understand that John is trying to describe the undescribable when he's looking at Jesus. He's trying to use terms and words to describe something that is indescribable. What we need to see is the glory and the honor and the majesty of the Lord. And that should bring us to a place of being on our face before him, falling at his feet like dead men, having awe and reverence for him. Now, this isn't so much as, again, a paralyzing fear thing, but understanding who he is and who we are. Charles Spurgeon said, we are never so much alive as when we are dead at his feet. Going back to what we talked about last week, denying ourselves, dying to ourselves, taking up our cross and following after him. It's not about adding Jesus to our life. It's not an addition thing. It's a submission thing. It's a, he is king, he is Lord, and we are here and we humble ourselves and we fall at his feet like dead men, dead women. We are at his feet as though dead. When we do that, we can hear what they heard. We can hear him say, don't be afraid. It's one of his favorite sayings, by the way. He says that a lot. (laughs) Don't fear. Now, let me just say, if you've never come come to a place of submitting your life to Jesus, trusted in him and him alone for the forgiveness of your sins, be very afraid. 
because there, there is no hope for you. You will face this one that we just read about as your judge, and you will face the wrath of God forever. But we, as those who have received him, who have trusted in him and submitted our lives to him, yes, we are to fear him. Yes, we are to come in that reverence and awe. But we are not only slaves of his, we are friends of his. He says, I am the first and the last. I am the eternal one. I was living, I was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore. Forevermore. His victory over sin and death is a permanent one, and we get to be the beneficiaries of that. He didn't do it for himself. He didn't need to. He did it for us. He did it for you and I because we needed it, and we couldn't do anything about it to, to fix it ourselves, to save ourselves, so he did it for us. And I love this. He, ha he says that he has the keys of death in Hades. That deals with judgment, and he holds the keys. He, the keys dealing and pointing to power and authority, and he has them. And he doesn't loan them out. He doesn't let anybody else have the keys. And if you're like me, it's good that he doesn't lose the keys. Doesn't go running around looking for them. He has them. He has the power. He has the authority over judgment, over sin, over death. So, as I mentioned, this week, it's been kind of neat starting on Monday as I started to read through this and started to, again, look back in the context and then reading, starting in verse 27, all the way through the transfiguration and doing that a few times, we kind of see this flow of everything and kind of a summary of these last few weeks, understanding Jesus said his path, the path for Jesus, the, the Messiah that came, his path was suffering and death, then resurrection, then glory. That was his path. And then he calls us as disciples. He says, if you wish to come after me, this is your path. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Then sanctification and then glorification. And again, that whole selective hearing kicks in, right? Because we're stuck on denying myself, huh? We get, what does that mean? Oh, really? I got to get, I got to do, I got and miss the whole part of the sanctification and glorification. Because the cool thing about the promises that we have in the scriptures, and these are promises for us as believers, that cross bearers are glory receivers. The cross isn't the goal. It's the path to the goal. When we take up our cross and we follow after him, glory is where we go. Romans 8 lays that out very clearly, is that this is how this works. And it is, it is in, in those two stages, that sanctification and glorification. Understanding, we do this often, justification is a moment in time. When you are born again, that is a moment in time. That's not a process, that is a moment. When you move from that death, as your eternal destiny to life eternal that is yours. It's a free gift, and you simply receive the free gift. You are born again in that moment. That is called justification. It's just as if I'd never sinned. All of my sin went on to Jesus' account, and I receive his righteousness in exchange. But then comes sanctification, that moment from being born again until that moment when we stand in his presence in glory, and that is a process. And that is a growing continually more and more into his image, becoming more and more like him. And Romans 12, chap chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual source of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what it, the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. That word be transformed is that Greek word metamorpho. <laughs> be transformed. The process, what he began in us, that work that he is doing in us, let that start coming out. That process of being transformed. 2 Corinthians 3.18. 
But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed. Again, that word metamorpho, being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the spirit, this process that we're going through. And it's a glorious process. It's painful at times. It's a struggle at times. It never, he never said it was going to be easy. It's work. Yes. The way is hard, but the other side is glorious. It's beyond comparison. That glorification, that what is to come, the Bible tells us, and I have several references here to this. I mean, it was one of those where I had to say, all right, I got to cut this off. I don't have all day to go through all of these, but the Bible is full of these. 1 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Now, Paul is not mocking what we go through when he says it's momentary light affliction. He's not, he's not saying, oh, get over yourself. He's not saying that. Paul suffered greatly in his, in his body. The point is, in comparison to what is to come, first of all, it's momentary. That's eternal. And then he says, it's light. <laughs> well, compared to what that is, the affliction that we go through is light affliction compared to the glory, as he says, that is beyond comparison. He says, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Romans 8.18, for I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Not, you can't even put them on the same scale. It's so far beyond. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then it says this, verse 3, For we consider him, Jesus, who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that we will not grow weary and lose heart. You ever feel like that? I just want to give up. I just, you know, and you start complaining to the Lord. It says, remember what he did. I got a picture. Isaiah, can you put that up for me? real quick. I saw this on a, on a meme this week. I thought this is so great. Whenever you start complaining again, this picture right here. Lord, my life is just, it's just not so hard. I just, I, and he's just sitting there. Yeah, okay, tell me about it. <laughs> After all that he went through, this, everything that he went through, think of that and remember that <laughs> when we grow weary and want to lose heart. 2 Timothy 4, 7, 8. I have fought the good fight. Paul says this at the end of his life. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but all to all who have loved his appearing. That is what is waiting for us on the other side of it all. Again, as I mentioned, this transfiguration, it's like a, it's like a preview of coming attractions. <laughs> Matthew 24, 30 says, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds and of the sky in the power in his great glory. The world's going to see it when he comes back in his glory. This was just a glimpse, and only three got to see it. Well, five, Elijah and Moses too. But everyone's going to see it when he comes again. But it's also a preview for us. Because John, right, 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. We're going to be fully transformed in that moment. We're going to, be, we're going to, we're going to get new bodies. We're going to get glorified bodies. And in those glorified bodies, we will be able to behold him in all of his glory. What an amazing, amazing thing. Yes, we are called to do hard things. Yes, the way is hard that is laid before us, but it is nothing, it is nothing compared to the glory that lay ahead of us. And that glory is only possible again because of what he did for us. And that's this morning, we're gonna celebrate communion and we're gonna remember that together as we 
as we do. So um, as the worship team comes up, um, we'll distribute the elements. There's the, the bread and the, and the juice that's there. And then we once, uh, once it's all distributed and the song is complete, we'll celebrate communion together. Let's pray. Lord, we, we do thank you. We thank you for the amazing gift that you've given to each one of us, that though we are so undeserving, your love for us was displayed in that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. That you took the entire weight, debt, penalty that was due us because of our sin, because of our rebellion. Jesus, you chose to take completely that upon yourself so that you in exchange would give us your righteousness. This glimpse that we see in the text today of your glory Lord, one day we will be able to behold that in your presence. And it's not because of anything we've earned. It's simply because of the gift you've given us. Lord, help us to understand that what you call us to do is not burdensome. To follow after you, to deny ourselves, to take up our cross. Lord, there is joy in that. And even the suffering, even the difficulty is nothing compared to the glory to come. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name, amen.